But if you stand with me this evening and we turn to the book of Genesis in chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, let me read the first five verses. This evening, let me just say this, about ten years ago or near ten years ago, we wrote an article uh, titled The Gap Theory, and that's what we're going to be preaching on tonight. And this article I have laying here before me, it's in the library, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do this evening. I was I was debating about uh, how to approach this tonight. What I'm going to do, you don't have to take any notes, I'm just going to follow the outline in this article and use, in other words, I'm going to use the same outline. So... Um, uh, so we're going to stay as close as we can to that. Now we're going to be talking about the gappers, not the rappers this evening. And notice with me as we read from Genesis chapter 1, the first five verses. This is called, by the way, the gap theory, or it is called the uh, ruin reconstruction theory. And there's actually some other names to it. And there's some good and godly people that have gotten caught up in this teaching over the years. And it is a theory, by the way. It is unscientific, it is unscriptural, and is absolutely unnecessary. And it is only a theory, it is an attempt to, by Christians to reconcile Moses and Darwin. And that's exactly what it is. It became popular in the 1800s around the same time that Darwin was doing his writing and so forth. And I'll say something about that in just a moment. Now, you'll notice as we come here in verse 1, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now let me stop reading here. Because verse 2 is going to be where our emphasis is at this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Now, Father, we thank You this evening for the Word of God. We thank You for the privilege that You've given us this day to, to assemble together and to fellowship and to pray and, Lord, to sing the songs of Zion and to preach Your Word. And dear God, we ask this evening Your anointing and blessing upon the reading of Scripture. We pray, Lord, that You meet with us tonight. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. And You may be seated. Now, this theory, it accommodates evolution and it allows for millions of years. Now, what I'm going to do this evening is I'm going to ask three questions and give you a brief answer for the first two. And the last question I'm going to ask and try to answer is I'm going to, we're going to have ten uh, points under number three. Now, first of all, let's begin with our questions and our answers. First of all, what is the gap theory? If you've not heard of that, I'm sure that you have in the time in which we live, but we're going to try to explain that this evening. Now, basically, if you come back here to verse 2, and this is going to be, the, this is the passage that becomes the issue among many when we study this subject, but the gap theory basically is the teaching that there is a gap or a long period of time between Genesis 1, 1, and Genesis 1-2, allowing the earth to be millions of years old. Now, that's the bottom line of this teaching. This teaching says that God originally created a perfect heaven and a perfect earth, perhaps even a pre-Adamic race. But through Satan's fall, judgment came upon the earth and its inhabitants. Now, this theory holds that the present creation, the one we're living, the present creation, is only a recreation beginning in verse 3 where it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And in other words, that would begin the first day of the recreation week. Now, again, this is an attempt to harmonize the Genesis account of creation with the accepted, basically, evolution teaching uh, that's been very prevalent since the 1800s. Now, first of all, what is the gap theory. I just gave you an answer for that. We're going to go through the first two very quickly. Number two, where did it originate? Now, I want you to think about this. It became popular in the 1800s. In the 1800s, people began to study geology and the layers of the earth. And so, in the 1800s, evolution began to be taught. To give you an example, this is when Darwin... 
wrote The Origin of the Species, which taught that through millions of years, everything evolved. Now, Darwin was doing his writings and his teachings. At that time, there was a lot of study, uh, again, of um, geology and the layers of the earth and things of that nature. Well, when Darwin came up with his theory and the millions of years and things of that nature, you can just begin to understand where the, the gap theory came from in Christian theology. Now, I'm going to give you some names here briefly. First of all, the man most responsible was a Scottish theologian. His name was Thomas Chalmers in the early 19th century. He lived between 17 and 80 in 1886, and he was contemporary with Charles Darwin, which lived from 1809 to 1882. There have been others that have taught this over the years, but this man was most responsible for the teaching of what we're calling tonight the Gap Theory. Now, there's another man by George Pembers. I have his book. He wrote, uh, he lived in the 1800s, I think early 1900s. He wrote a book titled Earth's Earliest Ages. And then how many have ever heard of the Schofield Reference Bible that was produced in 1909? Well, if you go back, I have one in my office. I started to bring it in here this evening. If you go back and look at the notes uh, in Genesis chapter 1, you're going to see the gap theory being taught. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, also in Isaiah chapter 45, there's reference to it as well. How many have ever heard of Clarence Larkin? Clarence Larkin wrote a, a book, a number of books, but one book is, was on dispensational truth in 19 and 20. I used to have that book in my library some years ago. I finally packed it in a box, and I don't know where it's at now. But uh, in, uh, he taught the gap theory in his book. And that was very popular. The Schofield Bible and that uh, book by Clarence Larkin is very popular by fundamentalists. Uh, other authors that taught this is Harry Rimmer, author Pink, author C. Custance, and I believe in 1770 wrote a book. George de Hoff and Donald Gray Barnhouse to bring you on up in, into our time. In other words, there's been many over the years. I'm not going to read this, but I br brought a copy of a very fundamental preacher that all of you would know if I called his name tonight. And uh, I just uh, copied this in case I wanted to use it tonight. But he's also teaching the gap theory. And I, when I became a Christian, and even when I began preaching almost, 27 years ago, I was taught the gap theory as being true. Now, notice as we come back here to this passage, by the way, it is not an historic position of the church. Well, we come here and again in Genesis chapter 1, notice when we're reading in verse 2, he says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. Now, the third point, you say, well, this is a quick sermon. The third point is, why is the gap theory wrong? And this is where we're going to have ten subtitles uh, underneath this, and we're going to get into the Scriptures now and begin looking at this. Why is the gap theory wrong? Well, number one, and again, all of this will be in the article, most of it written down, but uh, I, I'm going to hold on to here, and I ask, I'm going to read in, Matthew chapter 19, if you want to turn there, you can. If you don't, that'll be okay. But I'm going to take one verse from this chapter. Now, number one, under this third title, why is the gap theory wrong? Number one, I'm going to say because of chronology, Bible chronology. Now, this is very important to us. Biblical chronology testifies that the earth is less than 10,000 years of age. And you could go and you start with chronology. You could look in Genesis 5. You can look in Genesis chapter 11, uh, Luke chapter 3. And there's many other places that you can go and you can run from the, from the uh, creation of Adam all the way down to the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, from Adam's creation to his death, the Bible tells us in Genesis 9, there's 930 years. And here's the thing. Do you want to trust chronology, the Bible, or carbon dating, dating today? And there's a lot of problems with carbon dating. And uh, the science books are always evolving. They're always changing. If you go back 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 
and you compare them, they're always changing. The Bible never changes. Now, in Matthew chapter 19, reading one verse, and that's going to be in verse 4, he says here in this passage, and I want you to notice that according to Jesus, the creation of man was the beginning. It was the beginning of all things. And he says here in verse 4, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? So, according to Jesus Christ, the creation of man was the very beginning. It's the beginning of all things. Now, why do I say that? Coming back to Genesis, the chronology in the Bible gives us the only accurate record of creation and the dates as to when it took place. Okay? Now, let me give you an example. Even even Usher's uh, chronology, he says that the date of creation was about 404 B.C., making the earth about 6,000 years of age today. Now, let me give you an example of this. I'm going to have you to hold on to Genesis. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. But let me give you an example of... Bible chronology. In Genesis chapter 1, where we just read from, you have the actual six days of creation. They're recorded here. And then in Genesis 5, you have the chronology from Adam unto the flood. It's about 1,600 years. Then from Genesis 6 through 11, you have the time from the flood, and he gives us how long the flood lasted, and from the flood unto Abraham. Then in Genesis 12 through Second Chronicles, you have from Abraham to the length of the times that the kings reigned. Then in Daniel 9, you know the last king reigned, Israel goes into captivity with the Babylonians. Then you have the prophecy of Jeremiah, and in Daniel 9, we call it the 70 weeks of Daniel, 490 years, okay, starting from the time that they went into captivity. Actually, I'm sorry, 70 years of captivity, and then the 490 years until the time of Jesus Christ. Now, why did I say all that? You can start in Genesis 1 with the six days of creation, go to Genesis 5, and from the creation of Adam, he lived 930 years. It carries you all the way to the flood. Then from Genesis 6 through 11, the flood to Abraham. Then Genesis 12 through 2 Chronicles, you have from Abraham to the last king that reigned before Israel went into captivity in Babylon. And then we have Daniel's 70 weeks or 490 years, you know, there. And what I'm, what I'm getting at is that if you come through the Bible, you've got an accurate Chronology from the time Adam was created until the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why that they were those who knew when and where that Jesus Christ would be born. That this is why. How did they know that? Bible chronology. Not carbon dating. In other words, we go to the Scriptures. And so what I'm getting at is that we see that the earth is nowhere near the age that evolution say. The gap theory is a theory to accommodate evolutionary teaching. When Darwin came up with his book and his teachings and says, well, the earth is millions of years of age and and we have involved, you know, over these years. And the Christians, they started, many Christians started to panic at that time and says, well, maybe the earth is millions of years. We know we didn't evolve but maybe the earth is millions of years of age, so they came up with a theory to accommodate Darwin's teaching. And so what they're trying to do is reconcile Moses and Darwin. And it should have never happened. Now, okay, so the first thing this evening, number one, is chronology, not carbon dating. All right, now notice with me carefully. Uh, as we come to Exodus chapter 20, the second thing this evening. I'm going to try to keep this simple and plain. I can't complicate it anyway. don't have the sense to do it. But uh, if we go to the Bible and begin reading the Scripture, there is nowhere in the Scripture that you can come up with a gap between Genesis 1 and Genesis 
uh, one one and Genesis one two. I mean, it, it's not there. You have to be taught it. Somebody had to think this thing up and and then start teaching it. You don't come to that conclusion by reading the Bible. Now, the second thing is I want you to notice as we come to Exodus twenty. I'm going to read one verse here, and uh, notice in Exodus twenty, reading from verse eleven. Now he says here in verse eleven, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, the reason I come to this passage is that he says here in verse 11, the words, and all that in them is. Notice this, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and then he rested on the seventh day. According to this verse, the entire creation was completed in six days. The phrase, and all that in them is, includes, now listen to me, includes man, angels, Lucifer, dinosaurs, stars, animals, etc. It includes all of that, the six days of creation. Now, many of the gappers, we we'll call them the gappers this evening, many of the gappers, they will say, well, there's a difference between the word create and the word made. Okay? They'll say there's a difference. What they're trying to do is do some juggling, and they're trying to say, well, you know, the Bible may say create, you know, here, but here in this passage it uses the word made. Well, let me show you something. Turn to Genesis again. Let's go to Genesis 2. I'm not going to belabor this thought here because it's a silly argument. But notice as we come to Genesis Uh, chapter 2, and let's read in verse 4, and let's just see if there's a difference between the word create and the word made. Notice here, some try to make a distinction between these two words, but that will not work. They are interchangeable in the Word of God in many places. He says, by the way, if you're taking notes this evening, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, we see the Lord created man. But notice one verse, Genesis 2 and verse 4, the Bible says here, these are the generations of the heavens of the, of the earth. And he says, when they were created in the day that the Lord, what's the next word? Made. The same verse. And this happens a number of times in Scripture. So this is not going to work with those who teach the gap theory. Because here he says that he created and he also made. He created the earth, the heavens, he made the earth and heaven. Basically, the word is interchangeable. It's interchangeable in other places. Number three. Notice in Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1. Now, we're going to take this time two words, which means the two words, very good. Very good. Now, I want you to notice that as we come to this passage, that he said in verse 31, And God saw everything. Now, this is after the creation, the six days. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good, and the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Very good. If God had destroyed the earth and all the inhabitants, some even believe in a pre-Adamic race, some man on earth before Adam, and if God had destroyed the earth and all the inhabitants before the six days of creation, how could he call it? Very good. He could not call it very good. The Garden of Eden would have been over a graveyard. In other words, if there is a gap between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2, and there was a, and God destroyed this earth during this time, and if there were a pre-Adamic race, and animals, all these kind of things, and even man, some believe, that there would, he couldn't have called this very good because the Garden of Eden would have been on a cemetery. Now, I want you to notice when we hold on to Genesis and turn to Romans chapter 5. On this thought, very good. I want you to understand that there was no death before Adam. Some say there were death before Adam. There, but the Bible says there was no death before Adam. I'm going to show you later that the very concept of the gap theory undermines the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll show you that before we finish this evening. Now, you notice in Romans chapter 5, again, there's no death before Adam. He was the first 
man. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 and 22. In Adam all die, and Christ shall all be made alive. He's the first man. Death came through Adam. Not through uh, Satan, uh, during some first creation, all those kind of things. No. Once you see that the first animal to die was killed as a sacrifice for Adam and Eve. Now think about that. Not in some pre-Adamic judgment or whatever. He says here in Romans chapter 5, reading in verse 12, he says this, he said, Whereforth is by one man sin, notice that, entered into the world, notice, and he says, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sin. So it's by one man. Death and sin came into this world, affected this world, affected this universe through Adam. You'll notice in 1 Corinthians, I gave you the passage, I'm going to turn there and read it. If you're taking notes this evening, Romans 8, verses 9 through 25, and Hebrews 2, verses 5 through 18. The curse upon the earth is not from Satan. How many would agree with me this evening? It's not from Satan. Uh, it's, it's man. Satan's fall is not until after the six days of creation. And so, our problem this evening and our sin nature came from man. Okay? Came from Adam's sin. Now, notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to be reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to be reading from verse 21. Now, notice here in verse 21. He says here in verse 21, he says, For since by man came death. There it is again. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now turn back with me to Genesis. This time Genesis chapter 1. Now I'm not saying that Satan is not a problem. But our problem originally came sin Death. We die. It's pointed men wants to die. We die. Why? Because we're related to Adam. Because he sinned and he died and so we die also. Now, notice with me in Genesis chapter 1 and let's begin reading in verse 1 again. It says, In the beginning God created the heaven and earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of of the waters. The deep here has to do with the waters. In other words, the earth, we talked about this weeks ago, uh, about when God originally created this earth. In other words, it was, it was uh, covered with water. And then He divided the waters and the land appeared. Now, as we come here to verse uh, 2, I want you to notice that the verse begins with what word? And. Now, that's important. The reason I say it's important, every verse in Genesis chapter 1 begins with the word and except verse 1 and verse 27. Now, why is that important? This little word and here connects everything together. Okay? It is connecting everything together. Each verse lays a foundation for the next verse. So verse 1 and 2 are not anything different. Each verse is chronologically connected with the verse before and after. If you go down through this, for instance, verse 3, and God said, let there be light. Verse 4, and God saw the light. Verse 5, and God called the light day. Of course, this is the first day of creation. Verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament. Verse 7, and God made the firmament. Verse 8, and God called the firmament heaven. And the last part of verse 8 says, and this was the second day. Then in verse 9, he says, and God said. So, as we, the word and indica indicates connection. So, every verse is connected together here. There is no gap anywhere found in Genesis chapter 1. All right? Now, number 5. That was number 4. Number 5. Let's take the word was. Now, this is played on by the those who teach the gap theory. Verse 2 again. And the earth was. And the earth was without form and void. 
Now, the word was, they say the word was means became. Okay? That is, the earth became without form and void instead of was without form and void. Now, I know that's uh, doing a lot of twisting and finagling and so forth, but they must actually change the authorized version in order to teach this theory. Now, when he uses the word was here, the earth was. He's simply describing the condition of the earth just after its original creation. Now, the Hebrew word that's translated was is also translated became. It's H-A-Y-E-T-H-A. It can, it can be translated because or became, I should say, it can be translated became, it is not the case here, nor will the sentence structure allow it. In other words, when you read your Bible this evening, and he says in verse 2, and the earth was without form, you leave it the way it is. That's exactly what it means. We don't change this. 98% of the time of this word, Hebrew word's occurrence in the five books of the Bible, it is translated was. 258 times out of 264 times. The context lets us know exactly what he's saying. In verse 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth was without form and void. Okay? And I'm going to talk about this without form and void in just a moment. But let's, let's, consider, let's consider this word was in a few other places. Turn to, hold on here and turn to Exodus chapter 1. In Exodus chapter 1. Now, before I read in Exodus, let me give you a couple other examples. In Jonah 3.3, 3, the Bible says Nineveh was an exceeding great city. You know what that means? It means it was, not became. The city did not become a great city after Jonah entered it, but it already was a great city. In Genesis 2, well, I'll not use that one, Genesis 2.25. Uh, Genesis 3, 1 said the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field. Not, now, now think about that. Now we're going to read here in, in Exodus, and I think this will very well illustrate this, and it's dealing with Joseph. Now we know that Joseph went down uh, into Egypt uh, before the rest of his family went, right? You remember he was sold into slavery. Well, look at this. He said in verse 5, And all the souls that came out of the loins of Jacob went, were seventy souls, for Joseph was in Egypt already. Now, it says Joseph was in Egypt already. It would make no sense if it was he became in Egypt. Try to incorporate that in it. It doesn't work. The word was has to be there just like in Genesis chapter 1. Now go back with me to Genesis, in Genesis chapter 1, and let's notice something else here. Let's go to verse 2 again. Now, I know this will sound a little silly, but all I'm trying to do this evening, I'm not really trying to convince you of a lot of theological things. I'm just trying to convince you to believe the reading of the Bible the way it flows. There is a flow through Genesis chapter 1 in the six days of creation. There's a beautiful, smooth flow here, and there is no gap, there is no interruption. That's, why, that's all I'm trying to say to you this evening. Now, number six, I want you to see here the word without form and void. Now, this is really played on by those who believe in the gap theory. Verse one, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is a brief summary statement. And then in verses 3 through the rest of the chapter gives us a detailed account. In other words, he says, God created the heaven and earth. A brief summary statement. And then for the rest of this chapter, he's given us the details of the creation. Now, notice with me as we come here. And, and by the way, there's only twice in the Bible, the King James Bible, that the, the phrase, without form and void, is used. 
The other one is in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23. This is another text used by the gaffers. And the problem is, is the context in Jeremiah has nothing to do with creation or a gap here in Genesis chapter 1, uh, verse 2. It has nothing to do with that. If you go, and I want you to do that this week, go and read Jeremiah chapter 4, and when you read through Jeremiah, you're going to find that in verse 26, he's dealing with the judgment of cities, not here in Genesis. And in verse 27, the land that's mentioned in Jeremiah is Judah. Judah is mentioned in verse 27, verse 2, verse 5, chapter 1 and verse 15. And then the city in Jeremiah in verse 29 is Jerusalem, which is also mentioned in verse 2 and also chapter 1 and verse 15. In other words, when you read Jeremiah chapter 4, Jeremiah saw a vision of the soon coming Babylonians who would destroy Jerusalem and Judea, the land, and that's what Jeremiah 4 is all about. The land would become without form and void. Okay? It has nothing to do with a gap here in Genesis chapter 1. Then there's another passage in Isaiah 45, 18. I'm going to quote it for you. I'm going to actually read it. And you don't have to turn there. And this is not a contradiction of Genesis 1, 2 either. And here's what it says. It says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God Himself that formed the earth and made it, He hath established it, He created it not in vain, He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. God created the earth, He created it not in vain, but He created it to be inhabited. And the reason that Isaiah is talking about this, it has to do with Israel's promise. Isaiah reminds them that God created this earth not in vain but with a purpose and that God's promises to Israel have a purpose. Okay? Now, Isaiah 45.18 is not a contradiction of Genesis 1.2. Isaiah 45, 18 says God created not the earth and He didn't create it in vain. And here we find, and the earth was without form and void. And people will say, well, look here. Judgment came upon the earth. In Genesis 1, 2, this has to be judgment, you know, because of Lucifer and so forth. No, it doesn't have to be. And I want to give you an example of that. He says here, let's look at it again. Verse 2, and the earth was, not became, the earth was without form and void. Keep in mind, verse 1 is a brief summary statement. Verse, the rest of the chapter is a detailed account. And without form and void, many say this is judgment. God destroyed the earth after He created it. But that's not so. What, is, what does it mean to be without form and void? It simply means that it's void of life. It means that it's empty. It means that it's uninhabited. As in Jeremiah one day, that there would not be life there in Jerusalem because He's going to allow the Babylonians to come and destroy that. Here in this case, God created this, this earth. And we see that in verse 2, "...and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep." And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness He called night, evening to morning were the first day. When we say that something here is without form and void, it does not mean that it was a wasteland, but it was a place where no life existed. Why was it no life existed? Because Adam hadn't been created. The animals haven't been created at this time. This is day one. No plants has been created. There's nothing in the sea. I mean, the earth and the, and, and the waters haven't even been separated in day one. And so, what we're saying here is that it was formless. There is no beauty to it. The raw material is here. But we're basically saying here that it was unfinished. It was unfashioned. It was not completed. And anybody walking around in the woods has got enough sense to know that this is what he's talking about. To give you an example, in Psalms 31, 39, verses 13 through 16, David is describing himself when God formed him in his mother's womb. 
And he uses the word, he says, I was unperfect. Now, what did he mean by that? He's describing the undeveloped body before that he was born. While he's developing in his mother's womb, he was unperfect. He wasn't fully developed as far as his body. We know that the body grows and, and so forth inside the mother. And it's just like that a potter would take some clay. Have you ever sat down and watched anybody work with pottery? How many has ever done that? You ever just honestly sat down? Uh, that's one of the most fascinating things that I've ever seen in my life. It don't take a lot to excite me. But I've sat, I have sat for two hours at a time in, uh, in uh, near Birmingham, Alabama, at a state uh, park there when they had trades day. And I've sat there and watched them work with this clay. It is, is amazing at the process, but they will take unformed clay, clay that has no shape and no form to it, and put it on this wheel. It's shapeless, and this piece of clay, and they begin to form and shape it. When it begins, it's clay, but they begin forming and shaping it. And that's exactly what we have here in the book of Genesis. Notice in Genesis chapter 1 again, reading in verse uh, tw- 1, Genesis 1, 1, he says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. He's simply describing the, the, the shape, the condition of the earth, immediately after it was created. God created the earth, and then He began shaping it and creating life and separating the water, the seas from the land, and the plant life and the animal life and the sea life, and then man, He began, he began decorating this earth. Now, number seven. All right? Many of the gaffers, they say, well, the word darkness... You'll notice how many words they picked out of verse 2 and try to distort. The word was, the word without form and void. But they also come here and they say, well, look at the word darkness. They say that darkness is unnatural and it's evil since God is light. Now, is that true? They believe that God created the world in light, then later plunged it into darkness. That's not what these verses are saying. He says in verse 2, in the middle of the verse, he said, and, the, and, and there was darkness, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. The deep, there's the waters. And he said, and God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night as it is out here this evening. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now think about this. I'm going to give you some verses. Isaiah 45, 7, God created darkness. Psalms 104, verses 19 through 24, physical darkness is not evil. This darkness that we see out here tonight that you drove to church and it's already dark because of the time change. This that's not evil. If you read Psalms 104 verses 19 through 24, you'll find that it is considered a blessing to man because it allows him to rest after a day's work. God pulls down the shade for you at night and gives us darkness so that we can sleep and recuperate that we can enjoy that. Amen? It's not evil. Psalms 18.11 says, Darkness is said to be God's secret place. Exodus 20, verse 21, God was in a thick darkness on Mount Sinai. Genesis 1.5, here as we've just read, Each day of creation began with darkness, nighttime, and ended with morning. Evening and morning. Evening and morning. Now, yes, darkness sometimes is used as judgment in the Bible, but, uh, but we are, we're talking about physical darkness, which is not evil. God created it. Now, notice with me in Genesis 1, 28. Number 8. Number 8. 
The word replenish. Here's another word that's played on. I struggled with this word a little bit years ago myself. The word replenish. They say the earth was once filled and now to be filled, to be refilled rather, or filled again. Now, is that true? The word replenish is used here in Genesis 1.28 and Genesis 9.1 after the flood to replenish the earth. Now, let's keep in mind 1 Corinthians 15.45. There was no people before Adam because he was what? The first man. Let's keep that in mind. There was no man before Adam. So there's nothing to replace as far as man is concerned. Okay? And Genesis 3.21, Eve is called the mother of what? All living. All living. Now watch this carefully. He says in 128, And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Even in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, the primary definition of replenish is to fill. Fill. With no thought of a repeat. And the secondary definition is to fill again. So the meaning here, and this word is used other times in the Scripture, so it basically means to feel completely or fully. And so it does not mean that there was a race, a pre-Adamic race that was destroyed and now they're repeating the process or replenishing the earth. It does not mean that. basically means to feel. Just because the word starts with R-E, re, does not always mean to repeat or do it over again. Verse 28, to replenish means to fill the earth with people. And the Hebrew word translated replenish, uh, you can look it up and look at the other references on this, and it basically means to fill. All right, now number nine, number nine. Turn with me to Second Peter chapter 3. In 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse uh, 1. 2 Peter chapter 3, reading in verse 1. Number 9, Noah's flood. Why is this important? We're going to read these verses here. Begin reading in verse 1. The gap theory minimizes the judgment of Noah's flood in that it fails to connect Noah's flood with fossils, dinosaurs, and present formation of the earth. It fails to do that. Here's one quote. It said, The fossil record that gives evidence of a violent death and burial on a worldwide scale took place in Noah's day, not before the six days of creation. Now notice as we begin reading here, he says in verse 1, he said, The second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that you may be mindful of the words which are spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostle of the Lord and Savior. And he says in verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God, the heavens which are of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water, perish. But the heavens and the earth which are now, the same word are kept in store, reserved unto the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Now basically, in this chapter, you have three worlds that are mentioned here. But here in verse 4 and 5, you have the creation story. And then in verse 6, you have the flood story of the days of Noah. And then in verse 7, you have the future judgment by fire. Now, the gappers say that the world that then was being overflowed by water perished is a reference to the gap in Genesis 1. 
Look at this. He said in verse 5, For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, verse 6, being overflowed with water, perished. Now we know that the earth original creation was covered with water. And then the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. And by the way, we know that there's no life without water, right? The earth is covered with water. Then God separated the water from the land and formed seas. Well, the water was, the, the water was associated not in judgment. When God created this earth, there was water associated with the earth. But we find that this same water that was connected with creation, God used the water later to destroy the earth, but it was during the days of Noah, hundreds of years after creation. Now, the Yappers again say that, there, that, that the world that then was being overflowed by water perished is a reference to Genesis chapter 1, the gap. But of course, now, and I want you to notice this, Let's read verse 6 again, because we're connecting verse 6 with the flood of Noah. I mean, it's very clear. Verse 6, whereby the world, that is the same water that was associated with creation, he said, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. Noah's flood. Turn with me to Second Peter, the same, uh, the same writer, the same book. Notice in Second Peter, we're going to see that the world that perished was Noah's world, not a pre-Adamic world. It was Noah's world. Notice in Second Peter, one chapter back, reading in one verse, and this is going to be in verse uh, in verse uh, five. And please note, notice here as we read this. He says this. He says, and he spared not the old world. Here it's called the old world, and but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. The world that perished, though it was the old world, it's Noah's world, you see. And, and the thing about it is when you read through the New Testament, and I'm going to give you two references, Matthew 24, 37 through 39, and in Luke 17, verse 27 and 28, it is interesting to note that Jesus never spoke of a gigantic tragedy in Genesis 1, 2. He never spoke of a gap. He did not mention anything, but He did, in the verses I just gave you in Matthew and Luke, He did talk about Noah's flood. Now think about this. The Lord talked about the judgment of the earth with water, Noah's flood. But He never ever even hinted at something taking place before that. When the Lord talked about the second coming, and He talked about the judgment that would come at His, at His appearing. He's, he uses Noah's flood as an example of the judgment. He does not use a pre-Adamic judgment upon this earth. Now, if the Lord had destroyed the earth between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, if He had done that when He was preaching on His second coming in judgment, He would have probably used both of those examples. But He did not do that. There's no hint, no mention of it whatsoever. So it's so important that he compared his second coming not to a gap theory, not to a pre-Adamic judgment, but he, it was so important that the Lord compared his second coming to Noah's flood, which is judgment. Jesus called it the flood and never referred to any other flood. Never. Now turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. This verse and one of them we're going to close. First Timothy chapter 6. Number 10. Now again, everything I've said tonight, nearly, is in the article. The outline, the scriptures. But notice with me in First Timothy chapter 6. And then we're going to close in Colossians chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 6. One verse from this chapter. Now we're going to close with scientific proof. There is no scientific proof that the earth is millions of years of age. The science books always are in continual change and evolving. There is evidence of a young earth. This fits the chronology of the Bible, does it not, of a young earth. Many scientists today believe in a young earth. 
Many do not, but there's many do. The Bible says that we're to prove all things in 1 Thessalonians 5, 22. Why would I? And again, I've been there. I was taught this as a young Christian, even early in my ministry. The preachers that I were associated with, every one of them that I know of in the, in the conference I was associated with, believed in the gap theory. And that's why that I had believed it for a short period of time. But you, it's unprovable. You can't prove it in the Bible. It's, it's unnecessary. You don't need the gap theory teachings to accommodate Darwin and evolution. We don't need those kind of things. Now, we find here in this passage, in 1 Timothy 6 and in verse 20, he said, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so-called. We have no problem with science, but we do have a problem with science falsely so-called. And there's a lot of error in the scientific community today. Now, one last passage. Colossians chapter 2. So we're closing the gap. The only gap is between the ears. Amen? <laughs> That's the only gap is between the ears. Now, notice as we come to Colossians chapter 2. Now, if you were on a deserted island, you've heard me say this many times, and there's no way you could come up with the gap theory. If you had no former training, and you begin reading your Bible. You start in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, and you read through the book of Revelation. This is something that you must be taught. I was taught it early in my Christianity. I know no one personally who thought this up on them by themselves. They heard it from somebody else. I said that it undermines the gospel. It actually destroys the foundation of the gospel for it was man's rebellion that led to death and sin, right? And that is the reason that we need a Savior. It was man's rebellion that brought sin and brought death. And that requires a Savior. And Jesus, the Son of Man, He took up on the form of man and came to this earth and died for our sins. Sin entered through man, and it was through the Son of Man that sin was taken care of. Now let's close in this last passage in Colossians chapter 2. We've read this many times, but we read it again. He says in verse 8, he said, Beware, here's a warning, Beware lest any man spoil you, that is to rob you or to carry you away. He said through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. We're to be very careful uh, that we not be robbed or spoiled or, uh, through, through philosophy, vain deceit, and tradition of men and the rudiments of the world. Well, we're going to stop right there.